the official moonbilly.com podcast, your source for news and updates from the hottest token in DeFi. Here's your host, the voice of DeFi, Steven. I'm excited for today because today is AMA day. That's right. Today, I spoke with Siwon Kim, the CSO of KSM Starter, and he has a very interesting background of what brought him into the blockchain world. It was actually through the political field. Kind of interesting. So interesting AMA that we had with Siwon Kim. And we talk a lot about KSM Starter, a lot of kind of what makes it unique and what makes it special. You need to know it's on the Kusama network. And if you're not familiar with that, you have to listen to this AMA to learn a little bit more about it. We also took some community questions, giving away whitelist spots to the KSM Starter project. So make sure you take a listen to this in today's conversation. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Whatever time it is for you. Good 1730 UTC for everybody. A little bit earlier here today that we are uh, kind of meeting up because it's a it's a special day. So I'm just going to talk here for a little bit as everybody kind of uh, fills in to the room. And then we'll talk to Siwon Kim, which I think is going to just blow us away with a lot of Amazing information because it's an amazing project. So kind of come in here a little bit. Let me also turn on hand raising. There we go. Mute anybody. There we go. All right. So yeah, today we're going to have Siwon Kim. He is the uh, founder and CSO of KSM Starter. And KSM Starter is the primary launch pad on the Kusama network. And so I am really excited to learn about kind of just what makes C1 tick and uh, just what makes him kind of be motivated to be able to make such an ambitious project. Cause this is a very, very ambitious project. And really, I just want to understand better both the Kusama network as well as KSM starter. You know, a launch pad is always neat, but doing it on the Kusama network is certainly next level and you have to be pretty uh, knowledgeable to be able to do that. So to start with, I just want to make sure uh, you can hear me. See when Kim, are you, uh, are you, are you live and, and ready to roll? Hey, yeah. Ready as I could be. Yeah. um, And thank you so much for the very generous um, introduction. Very grandiose. I appreciate it a lot. (laughs) Grandiose. I like that. I don't know if it's, I mean, (laughs) You know, don't uh, don't sell yourself short. You've you've got some grandiose accomplishments. So yeah, don't, uh, I'm, a, I'm a humble man. I'm a humble man coming from humble background. So hey, I'm, that's... I'm, I'm I'm really appreciate I'm really appreciate I'm being here. So yeah, thank you for having me. No problem, no problem at all. Um, and yeah, that's the way you should. Anybody that's great should still act like they present themselves as they're humble because I think that makes you a better uh, team builder. So. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Give me a little bit of your background and ultimately how you got involved in crypto and blockchain. Ah, sure. Um, so one thing that not a lot of people actually know about me is, um, so I actually have a um, political background. Um, so I studied uh, Middle Eastern politics that got me to work with the U.S. State Department in their um, embassy services. So I was serving the U.S. Embassy in uh, Qatar. Um, and that kind of got me to work with the South Korean government. I'm, I'm South Korean myself. Um, and sort of, you know, once you start working in politics, I think you're sort of presented with this. I mean, you present the idea that, oh, like I can change so many things. But, you know, there's a saying in politics that, you know, um, you know, politics either changes you or you just have to leave. Um, and, and you know, as, as, as it goes, it's very hard to change politics. And um, so I ended up sort of leaving there. Um, and then, you know, that was when I sort of moved to Berlin and um, didn't really know, um, you know, what was going to happen. Um, and quite luckily enough, I'm, I mean, I was working sort of in, in traditional marketing and then I got approached by one VC. Um, and VC slash accelerator called Longhash. And at that time, Longhash was establishing their headquarter in, in Berlin. Um, so I helped them sort of establish that headquarter. Um, that they were investing quite heavily into crypto. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, through that connection, I got recruited by one of the, one of the investment projects in crypto space. And that's how it all began. That's uh, that's quite a uh, change from, you know, kind of a political background. And uh, I mean, you, you you say it well of how you actually went from political to uh, kind of a blockchain and incubator background. But it's still very interesting. One thing I like is, you know, we actually had a 
crypto person that used to be in politics. So maybe that helps you or will help you in the future to be able to navigate kind of those tough waters of how you can navigate things uh, politically, because, you know, sometimes crypto and politics don't always mix real well or as well as they should. So do you feel like yeah, your yeah. background kind of helps you with that in the future? Um, it definitely helps me in presentation skills and in, and in sort of speaking skills. Um, you know, every, everyone in politics have to kind of have a silver tongue. Um, so it definitely helps yeah. there, I think. <laughs> yeah, because you, you've seen it from the other side. So you kind of know yeah, exactly. how to present it and things like that. That's pretty interesting. So that was your, you know, dip toe, you know, dipping your toe into the water for crypto, which is always, you know, kind of interesting for everybody of how we always got started. But and I want to talk about the KSM starter for sure today, but I feel like we need to lay a foundation first. Let's talk about the Kusama network. Can you talk about what you think is great about the Kusama network and how you think the network in and of itself can help advance the industry? Um, sure. So I think one sort of, I mean, it's not a misconception because it is ultimately true, but a lot of people tend to dismiss Kusama by saying, oh, it's just a test net for Polkadot. I mean, in, in, a, in a nutshell, it is. But at the same time, when when you're a test net for something, then you, it also means that when it comes to different upgrades, when it comes to different testing, it's always going to be the first place. So when somebody says it's a test net, I think I kind of you know, take a step back and I usually tell them, well, it's not just a testing you know, space. It's actually sort of ground zero of every little innovation that goes into Polkadot itself. Um, so I think personally, that's that's what makes Kusama really stand out. And obviously, there are two different networks, um, Kusama and Polkadot. Um, however, they're intertwined. But I think the sort of um, ability to, to um, sort of be that the place where all this innovation will take place first before it's implemented into Polkadot. I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, a lot of projects who are involved in some network can obviously take advantage of that because when you're involved in an ecosystem that is designed to be a first mover, then you know that you're definitely going to, I um, mean, sort of stay ahead of the curve. Um, so I think that's a, a very sort of a comprehensive way of understanding some network. That, that's interesting because, yeah, you definitely do hear that. Uh, I don't want to say detractors, but people will say, hey, it's a test net for Polkadot. And I, I, I get where they say that because, like you said, that is in and of itself true. But you're certainly yeah. right in saying that, hey, if you're going to be kind of a first mover, if you're going to be in, you know, what am I trying to say, cutting edge kind of projects, then on the Kasama network, that certainly would be the place for that to happen. So, you know, moving on into KSM Starter. That kind of makes sense. And maybe that's I'm answering my own question that I'm about to ask is, is that how KSM Starter was birthed is seeing an opportunity or an underserved segment of the market for needing a launch pad on the Kasama network? Um, in, uh, it's yes and no. Um, so let me let me kind of um, you know, take you through the um, little bit of journey. So, um, sure. you know, throughout, throughout my, my past few years, I'm working in crypto. I have been in contact with many different projects. I've helped um, me and, and, and my co-founder, um, you know, we've we've brought a lot of projects to different launch pads. You know, some launch pads we even helped them launch with their marketing and things like that. So, um, you know, when it really came to working with different launch pads, we saw that there was an overall shortcoming um, and you know, different, um, you know, however small, um, different little flaws that can impact either the public or the project. Um, so we wanted to create a launch pad that essentially sort of um, you know, improves on, on the current launch pad and sort of offers a more comprehensive product that can be beneficial for the projects and the community, not just building up to the ideal and on the ideal day, but, you know, just moving forward. We want it to be a, a launch pad that truly fosters new incoming projects throughout their lifetime. Um, so that's why we started building this launch pad. And we, I mean, I don't want to sound too, um, too confident, but, you know, we ultimately knew that our product is superior, is better, and that it can outcompete most of the launch pads out there on, on no matter what chain we really go on to. Um, but, you know, sort of having, um, sort of, um, having been involved in many different projects throughout their IDO phase, we were also incredibly lucky to reach out to different founders that we help, um, and then ask them, hey, you know, what are you looking for? Um, you know, what was your experience? And throughout this time, we realized that 
if you truly want to build a, a launch pad that is overall ben- beneficial for everyone, you have to think in the shoes of those people who are going to be taking the benefits from you. So then we look into, you know, well, what are new projects essentially looking for? New projects, in, in our opinion, in, in my opinion, um, they're looking for two different things. The first one is obviously interoperability. If you're a new project and you have a solution that is a standalone that does not integrate with any other existing solutions out there, the chances are, it's going to sound a bit grim, but the chances are you're not going to survive very long because you're just a tiny, tiny fish in a big sea, right? Um, So you need to be working with other different projects out there. Um, And the second, of course, is um, looking into what makes new projects exciting and why are we all here, you know, all these people who are tuning in right now and why are they even interested in hearing about us? Well, because new projects are genuinely exciting. You know, they have different innovations. They have different perspective and opinion into how things are going in the current current sort of market situation. Um, so therefore, in order to support these new exciting features, a lot of these new projects need to essentially extensively test these new features because by testing, you can only make this perfect new product that will be offered to the public. So when we look into interoperability, when we look into sort of um, this grounds that allow new projects to test their um, product and their ideas, we quickly came to the realization that you know, Xama is obviously the right choice for it. Um, so that's why we decided on, on Xama. Interesting. So, yeah, I, first of all, I appreciate the the in-depth answer. A lot of times I will ask a question and, you know, it's like baseball. I send it right down the plate and I expect the uh, the person answering the question just to knock it out of the park. <laughs> but you 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 actually gave a very detailed answer there that was a little more than maybe even I was expecting. And one of the things I thought you said that was interesting is your your platform is almost I don't want to say built by founders. Obviously, your team built it, but you took quite a bit of input in you know, from founders that you already knew to to address the needs that you knew that founders were having with other launch pads. Um, just real quick, and, and, and this isn't something I've, this is a question that I just wonder immediately off the top of my head. Can you give like an example of one thing that founders said, we, we really need this in a launch pad and it's not out there already? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, so this particular project um, applied for an idea on on Polka Stutter, and um, you know Polka Stutter reviewed their their application, their analysts looked at it and asked a bunch of questions. And at the end of the day, they said, "Well, sorry, it's going to be a no." Um, and this project asked them, "Well, what's what's the reason behind it?" And you know Polka Stutter said, "Well, because of internal reasons, we're not allowed to you know share these reasons," which. I mean, I, I have full respect. Um, so, so you know that that's completely okay. Um, but why that is so dangerous, in my opinion, is that let's say that you're you have a project, you build something that's kind of like your baby. In your eyes, it may have little flaws, but it's still like you know pretty great. Um, and then you hear a no from another person, and that person tells you, "Well, we cannot tell you why." Especially in audio space, because there are so many launch paths. What you do is you say, "Well, okay." screw you, I'm going to go to another place that can appreciate my baby, so, you know, because yeah. that's your passion. Um, so then another launch pad ultimately accepts, yeah, sure, let's go for it. But what really happened there? Well, what really happened is that some experts are concerned about your project and you don't know why. You don't know your own shortcomings. So without realizing it yourself, you're offering a in sort of an, an you know, a, 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 an, an imperfect product to, to, to the public. And you don't really mean to do that. You know, that's not your intention. You don't want to, you know, send out a, a sort of a half ass product to the market, but that's essentially how it's treated. Um, so, you know, that is why, um, you know, I saw that as a, as a problem because first of all, it's just not ben- beneficial for the entire ecosystem. Um, and, and second of all, it's really disrespectful to the public, isn't it? Like when, when you're offering something and says, well, somebody said it's not good enough. I don't know why, but here you go, invest your money. Man. That's really disrespectful in, in my opinion, at least, um, because you know, you're know you asking for people's heart and dollars. Um, so that's why you know we kind of created this sort of a, a feedback system with, with our ecosystem um, sort of council members um, where they're supposed to vote on it, but every single vote has to be followed by a feedback. And whether that's a yes or a no, whether the final answer is a yes or no, the feedback is shared to the project. So even if it's if it's if it's a no, 
we tell them exactly why it's a no so they know what to work on because we know that they will they want to continue working on their product and if we can provide them this guidance then at the end of the day maybe they won't do an audio on ksm starter and that's completely fine but then they will be able to launch a better superior product to the, to the public and ultimately benefit the entire ecosystem so that's kind of how that approach really went like Man, that, that is really interesting to me. And I really like how you said, like, it's almost like disrespecting the investor. I think anybody else might have said it's, you know, treating the investor like their their opinions don't matter. And, and But I like yeah. just going a step further and saying it's actually disrespecting them. I, I don't know. I, I really like the way you put that, because I think as an investor, like you said, it is hard earned money. And for yeah. some people, you know, just a few bucks. What, what What is just a few bucks to me to another person in another part of the world may be quite a bit of money. And for them to invest in something and do you not take their opinion seriously? Well, that's kind of a slap in the face. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that's a great way to put it. Now, you just now touched on this is the, the Dow aspect of KSM Starter. And this mm-hmm. seems really incredible to me as far as the voting. So do I understand that KST holders, the holders of the token, they can vote in favor of a token offering and and, and kind of decide what's going to be on the platform from the community? Is that is that kind of in a nutshell what you just said? Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have two different parts. So we have the ecosystem council um, that that essentially sort of does the initial due diligence. Um, and then once it passes that, then it's offered to the token holders. Then that's where the real voting starts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's really interesting. I, I do believe you're right. The, the more I'm hearing about your, your launch pad, it's much more of a voice to the user of the launch pad than other launch pads. I mean, being able to kind of use the DAO system to decide you get in, you don't get in. That's, that's really, that's, that's really kind of next level. So what happens to the projects that don't get voted in favor of, do they get to, you know, assess the feedback and then come back and apply again? Is there a limit to reapplication? How does that work for the rejected folks? Mm-hmm, sure. Um, so when they're rejected from the token holder um, sort of voting um, stage, that means that their product is essentially you know, fundamentally strong, but it's maybe just not eye-catching for the public, you know, the, the retail investors. Um, so you know, this is kind of a, a way for them to gauge how they will perform in the market before even they go in the market, right? Um, so if they have not received enough votes, then they're more than welcome to come back and work on it. Um, and it, it's essentially sort of, they can always reapply. So they can sort of apply as, as many times, times as they want. Um, but, you know, obviously they would need to sort of have worked on that because, you know, it's, it's, it's not because, oh, it was a bad season. No, this isn't a seasonal business. Um, if they haven't received enough votes, it simply means that, you know, they're not able to capture the interest of the retail investors. So they need to look into their product. Well, is it the product market fit? Is it the way that they're explaining things? Is it because they, what they're doing is irrelevant to the current market trend? They need to reassess those. Um, and once they have done that, then they're more than welcome to reapply. Man, I love that. And as I'm as I'm thinking of if I voted against uh, an IDO from actually getting on the launch pad and they didn't uh, address the needs that I had said or the community had said, and then they reapplied and they didn't even do anything. You're right. Not not only would they get rejected again, they'd probably get rejected even harder with more votes because people would be kind of mad that you didn't even listen to the feedback last time. So that's pretty interesting. So you also have a unique incentive system that incentivizes your community members to hold the previous IDEO tokens. Can you explain Mm -hmm. that and talk about how that might affect projects looking to use KSM Starter? Sure. Um, So in a nutshell, um, we are incentivizing people to hold their IDEO tokens by um, saying, let's say that you know you bought some allocation and you got whitelisted, you bought allocation of let's say token A throughout the IDEO. Um, and let's say you know you hold you know 80% um, and then you sold 20%. Now that 80% is reflected into how you're selected in the next IDEO phase. So it, it, you know, I mean, in, in a very simple term, um, you know, it's just incentivizing people who are holders. Um, but you know, what does that mean? We are, in a way, picturing a, a larger picture for the projects and for our token holders. When token holders realize that by just holding the previous IDEO tokens, they have a higher chance of getting whitelisted for the next IDEO, then in their mind, these two IDEOs are somehow interconnected. 
right? And in and, and the ch- and the chain of value addition just goes on. This sort of mindset is also reflected into how projects are thinking of each other. If I'm supposed to do an audio on KSM Stutter, let's say next week, I'm going to pay particular attention in how the project that is doing an audio before me is is performing. Um, And, you know, I would want to essentially support that because, you know, that sort of popularity would kind of, you know, sip into my popularity and then go on to the next next idea. So as a project, you're more incentivized to partner with them, to help them, um, you know, to give them feedback if necessary. So in, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect all the projects who are coming to do an audio because when they do an audio on case and startup, we don't want them to, to be considered as fragmented individual parties. We want them to be essentially welcomed as a new member of this overall case and startup family and ultimately as a new member within the Kusama, um, Kusama um, network um, ecosystem. So that is kind of um, the, the main reason behind it. Man, there, there, there's actually a lot to unwrap there. I, I really like the idea that I, as a token founder, would feel good about, hey, people are incentivized to hold my token because they may want to get in on the next person that comes into the to the clubhouse. And then on yeah. top of that, I, as an investor, I feel good about this because I know the rest of my community is looking to hold, right? Because they want to get on the next uh, whitelist. And by them holding, it might help each individual, uh, you know, token be able to have, you know, buyers and, you know, just just holders the whole time. So I, I really think that is a good way both of satisfying both the token founder as well as the investor as well. So let's talk about team a little bit, because I think mm-hmm. always team management, whether you're talking sports and a coach or a big business and a CEO, I always think it's interesting dynamics. And I can see just on your website, I can see three other team members besides yourself. How did you and your team meet and were you able to handle or how are you able to handle the, the team dynamics, you know, that you know, in fight or anything like that? Or uh, how are you doing that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, in, we, when we have more team members, um, I actually should add them to the website. Um, so we, we have more team members, you know, coming from many various um, backgrounds. Um, but especially when it comes to dynamics, I think, um, you know, that individual passion is really important. Um, because, you know, without passion, you can't really survive in this industry. You know, it, this, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you also understand that when you're working within this industry, within crypto and blockchain, it doesn't, be, it's not just work, it becomes your lifestyle. So unless you're willing to put in everything you've got and more and make sacrifices to make something happen, you're not going to survive. Um, I'm, I'm really lucky and sort of blessed that all our team members have that same level of passion, um, you know, even though they all have different backgrounds and, and so on and so forth. So in terms of how our team dynamics really go, um, I mean, first of all, we are completely decentralized. So that means that you know, we have team members all around the world um, and, you know, they are free to work, you know, wherever, wherever they are. Um, but, you know, we maintain that, that level of, of communication to really get things, uh, get things flowing. Um, do we have disagreements? Of, I mean, of course we do. I mean, I would be lying to you if I told you, oh, we don't have any disagreements. Um, but at the end of the day, the disagreements come from the same place, which is you know, your love and passion for what you're building. Um, so I always try to remember that. Um, and, you know, because it's disagreement about how we should do things because we want to be as successful as possible. We want to make sure that our product is um, the best it can be. People have different ideas about how they want to achieve that. It's a a question of method. But when it comes to result, everyone's um, sort of aiming for the same thing. So, I mean, that's what I try to remember. And that's what, I mean, everyone, of course, has has in their mind. And yeah, I mean, that's just how how we manage things. And then we get along really well. Um, Everyone's extremely talented at what they they do. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, one person has an emergency or something to do, something else important to do. Um, then, you know, we hold the fort and make sure to cover for each other and make sure that we all got each other's back. And yeah, and that's that's how we are. Man, I, I can't help but to think like a sports analogy there. You're basically the coach that is saying, guys, 
we're going to do some infighting. It happens, but let's remember we're all trying to win. And I, I feel like yeah, it's kind exactly. of the same thing for you there. It's like, hey, we're all having the same goal here. We may have different ideas between us on how to achieve that goal, but we definitely all have the same goal. And it sounds like that's, you know, it can be difficult in crypto because you're dealing with money and egos and, and you know, different levels of talent and things like that. So it always, to me, is a a balancing beam to work. And it sounds like you've got a good perspective on how to do that. It's just a reminder of that you're all kind of going for the the same thing here. So yeah, let's talk Let's talk real quick about marketing because you can have the greatest token ever, right? You can have the greatest launch pad ever, and then you can have the greatest team ever. You can literally have, you know, Hall of Fame team members in part of your mm -hmm. token. But if you don't mm -hmm. tell anybody about it, it really doesn't matter, right? If you if you can't uh, get the word out, it doesn't matter. And every crypto project will will die on the vine if they do not get the proper marketing out. So what do you, what do you and your team have planned to make sure that everybody knows about what an opportunity KSM Starter is? Well, I mean, of course, on top of our priority list is I um, you know AMA with Moon Willie. Um, hey, hey that, that's the <laughs> smartest move you've done yet. And first of all, that's a smart answer just anyway. You just, you, you know what you're doing, but go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that I've, I've buttered you up a bit. Uh, you're right, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, th I think it, um, marketing is, of course, very, very important. Um, but, you know, um, as, as a person who also has done a lot of marketing for many different crypto projects, <laughs> Um, I think the essential problem with marketing in crypto is that you tend to over promise and under deliver. Um, in, in good cases, sometimes you over promise and never deliver. Um, and I wanted to avoid a lot of these, um, because I just first, I think it's unethical. And second, I just didn't really want to be involved in all these sort of, you know, sort of hot air. So we've, I mean, first focused on making sure that our product is is as the best it can be and that our marketing is essentially highlighting what we have built instead of what we will build in the future. You know, so it's it's a um, sort of a different perspective into how our marketing sort of vision is. Um, and obviously we need all the all the marketing help, right? So, I mean, we do have many different investors, KOLs, influencers, um, some different groups that are very passionate about KSM Stata, um, you know, who are helping us, you know, reach as many different people as possible. But we're taking it as um, when you look at traditional marketing, the first thing that really comes up is messaging, right? So you can reach so many different people, but if your messaging isn't right, then you're just blank noise to them. Um, so one sort of key aspect in our marketing is essentially education. We want people to know not just about KSM Sada, but what is an ideal, what is Kusama, you know, what is Substrate, why does this matter? Um, so that people are essentially more knowledgeable by, by you know, being with us. And hopefully at the end of the day, you know, they'll be able to support us. Um, so I think we are taking this sort of educational approach rather than promotional. Um, and so far it has been working out very, you know, very well. But I mean, you know, we are obviously continuing to look for different help in marketing. I'm trying to make sure that our message does reach as many people as possible. Um, and also I'm um, focusing mainly on feedback, right? So when there are different questions throughout um, our past AMAs, I mean, I actually like have a huge document um, where I write down every single AMA questions, even the ones that I don't get to. Um, because I think there is something in there when people ask questions, when pe people provide feedback, no matter how insignificant it may sound, there is always a little bit of gem inside there. So that's actually what we use to produce a lot of our marketing materials to make sure that, you know, we are as in touch as possible with our community and, you know, going beyond that. So, yeah, I mean, that, okay. that has been our approach. And so far it's been doing okay, of course, but, you know, hopefully after this AMA, um, you know, we'll just, you know, explode. <laughs> it just explodes. Of course, of course. So this is very interesting to me. It almost whenever you hear marketing, I feel like you kind of interpret that as well. We're going to do marketing by education, which education isn't a bad idea, especially whenever you're dealing with the Kusama network, because not everybody may know about it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes in different crypto communities, I have trouble uh, helping people understand what pancake swap is, much less what a parachain is. Uh, so it can get, you know, quite, you know, difficult for somebody to understand. If I am new to your community 
and I say, I'm a blank slate. I don't know anything. How are you looking to help educate? Or I guess what I'm asking is what different educational materials do you have out there? Are you using social media? Or are you just doing it within your Telegram chat? Um, I mean, yes, I mean, all of the above. So, you know, we are doing it on social media. We are you know, working with different people who can produce contents on YouTube, um, graphics, Telegram, you know, telling people about it, answering questions whenever we can, um, you know, just, just going going from there. So that's oh. how, that's that's how, I mean, we try to answer as many people as possible. And, you know, um, because it's, it's, I mean, education is really important, especially in crypto, but especially when it comes to, the substrate ecosystem. It's very new and I think a lot of people are aware of it because they hear about this um, you know, parachain auction and things like that. But parachain auction isn't all there is in, in, in the substrate ecosystem, right? There are there's so much more. And I think the more people know, the more that they can take advantage of it. And you know, hopefully in, in crypto, you know, that sort of allows them to enter different earning possibilities um, and you know essentially just improving their their quality of life. Um, that's what we're trying to do. Man, th- th- that's awesome. And I always think you're just advancing the industry too, just crypto in general, as you help to educate people, because if more people are educated, it just helps out the industry because everybody understands it, it, you know, what it is that uh, crypto can accomplish. Exactly. So, yeah. Real quick. And so, first of all, thank you for, you know, so many good answers from the questions that I asked. But now I want to give the community a chance to ask the questions. Uh, so if you will, I'm going to talk about Moon Willie for a second, just to give you a little bit of time. But all the questions that people have been asking have been being pinned in the chat. So while we've been talking, um, the team has been pinning the different questions that people have been asking. If you will pick four questions from uh, the uh from the group here. And if mm-hmm. you can, if you want to, you can just reply to them. One, reply to the second one, two, reply to the next one, three, reply to the next one, four. And, uh, and then we'll kind of go over those, those top four questions that you pick. And now I know that you're going to take even all the questions and put them into your giant spreadsheets. <laughs> you know, kind of what the community is <laughs> thinking. But, uh, I'm actually already doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So now we have a little uh, behind the curtain peek of how Siwon Kim uh, manages these AMAs. He's, he's, he's data mining is what he's doing. He's data mining for what everybody wants, which is very interesting. So I'll let you do that. In the meantime, let me talk about the Moon Willie coin or token for a moment. So Moon Willie is an auto reward token. And this auto reward token pays out not in more Moon Willie, but it pays out in the stable coin of DAI. Every transaction that occurs within Moon Willie. 8% 8% of every transaction is then converted to die and then redistributed amongst the holders of Moon Willie. So if you hold a big old mound of Moon Willie, then you can get uh, a big old mound of die eventually as it builds up. This happens with transactional volume. And if there's enough transactions, buys and sells, or just transfers to your grandma, whoever, uh, it will eventually up to 24 times a day, you could get this payout in die. This is great because then if the market is tanking, you're converted to a stable coin that's going to be, you know, staying at a dollar. Or if the market is in a huge bull run, obviously your Moon Willy tokens will be worth more as they get converted to die as well. So it's kind of a hedge against the market. So if you're unfamiliar and you're here and you're saying, hey, I, I, I follow uh, Simon Kim everywhere he goes uh, and uh, what's this Moon Willy thing about? That's the nuts and bolts of it, but you can certainly learn more about it just by heading to moonwilly.com and uh, learning a little bit more about this. We do an AMA, or not an AMA, but a podcast live every day here at 1800 UTC, so about this time. We started a little bit earlier today for this AMA, but right about this time, I go live, and once a week, we bring in a great guest such as Siwon Kim to be able to uh, just discuss their projects, discuss what they have going on, and uh, many of them are just as interesting as today's uh, was. So, uh, uh, see when have you been able to pick, uh, you know, four questions or so, and uh, and which ones you want? Because I see I see quite a few people are uh, putting in quite a few questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for for all the great questions. Um, I'm I'm just reading through through it all, and you know, a lot of them are you know very sort of extensive. So I, I really love that. Um, so I think the first question I'll, I'll read is from, um, from 
Avelis. Avelis. I think that is how I should pronounce it. Um, I always say Avelis. Yeah, he, Avalis? he he's, he's a common Avelis. Yeah, he's always in here. So uh, yeah, I think it's Avelis. But go on. Go awesome. On. Awesome. All right. So um, I mean, thank you so much for the great question, Avelis. Um, so the question is essentially about um, you know proper implementation of democracy and transparency to maintain a unified community. <laughs> Um, so I think I'll answer this and, you know, there's a second question also from, um, Aki 2020, also talking about, um, sort of that, that, that democracy, because he talks about Wales and things like that. So I think I'll combine these two questions and sort of answer at the same time. Um, so in terms of democracy, um, you know, that, um, democracy really comes in when you can make decisions, but at the same time, when your decision-making power matters. If you're making decisions on something that doesn't matter as a core part of the project or of whatever the system is, that's not real democracy. That's just an illusion of choice. You know, because it's like saying, oh yeah, um, you know, like, yeah, I'm gonna get a, 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 like a Big Mac set at McDonald's. You can choose what dipping sauce I should use for my French fries, right? It's, it's not really a choice. <laughs> Um, so yeah. that's that's where um, you know our sort of voting mechanism comes in for people to decide which IDEO should be offered. Um, so that's how we are really imp- implementing that um, that democracy into sort of our system. And one key aspect about transparency is also um, quite important is when our ecosystem council members provide feedback for each um, you know, pro- each um, project. This feedback is actually shared on um to to the, our our token holders when they're making a vote right so when they're making a vote they can actually see oh you know um this ecosystem council members liked um liked this one um this one aspect about the project um didn't like this one aspect about, about the project but that's where all this transparency really comes in um so that's kind of how it's built into our um, core product and um i think there is also um you know, this question about whales as being it's a question about transparency in whitelisting, right? So um, there are two parts to whitelisting. So first, we have the Chainlink DRF integrated. So that means that our random lottery is actually verifiable on chain. Um, so I think there is a lot of transparency there. Um, and second thing is also, um, and this is actually the first time I talk about this aspect on uh, in, in public. Um, so what we're currently doing is, um, we're trying to build a system where, um, you know, we are able to sort of analyze the behavioral um, aspect of each wallet involved. And if your behavior is, um, it proves that you're a, a strong believer, you tend to hold tokens, um, you know, you tend to actively participate in the ecosystem, not just about our ideals, but you know, just how your wallet is, um, is in general. And then uh, what we do is we kind of add a little bonus um, sort of rank to that wallet, right? So you could literally be somebody who just holds hundred dollars in your wallet or even less, but you know how you trade, how you interact with the with the entire sort of market is that you tend to believe strongly in the projects that you invest in. Uh, you know when they have staking or whatever, you tend to you know really participate in that. Then in our in our view. That wallet, no matter how small the amount, is more valuable than another wallet that may have fifty thousand, five hundred thousand dollars in there because you are a more valuable member when it comes to participation. Um, so that is how, and and therefore you are going to be rewarded by by, by case and sort of by um, sort of having the increased chances of being whitelisted. Um, so that is how we are sort of implementing that. Um, so I think that's how I would answer these two questions. Um, Barry, so, I'll let you pick a third one and I'll just talk for a second. That way you can kind of get in your thoughts while you kind of look at that third one. But that's that's really interesting to me that, you know, your your holding time um, can can really help out your chances of getting in. And, and that was a valid concern. You know, is, is, is this just another whale game where whales are going to be able to get in on the next project better than the, the little guys? And I, th- I think you answered that well of how you can kind of balance that out a little bit by by holding as well, rather than just a whale getting a bunch and then dumping it right after afterwards yeah definitely um so i actually picked question number three and four um okay question three is um from mohammed 
now far, um, you know, talking, asking about the biggest breakthrough of the KSM project in the second half of um, 2021, and will there be developments that make your investors happy? Well, I mean, we know that the biggest breakthrough um, within the Kusama ecosystem, obviously, is going to be KSM startup. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, You're no, just but, kidding, I mean, but are you? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just uh, sending like subliminal messages here. Um, no, but I mean, it's <laughs> it's also, I mean, there's there's a lot of promising projects, you know, such as Karura, such as Moonbeam, obviously. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to breakthrough, and, and this is something that I believe in, and this is also reflecting into how I tend to invest in, in various projects and tokens, is I am a big believer in those that enable um, a, a better facilitation of the ecosystem, right? So when you look at, you know, the overall crypto ecosystem, you know, you have like Bitcoin, Ethereum, blah, 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 and, and then you have you know, Polkadot, Kusama, and, and things. But even within that, you know, there are certain players that, make the ecosystem more accessible, right? So, I mean, that's kind of what we are also trying to do, what KSM Slaughter is trying to do. Because also a lot of people say, hey, why do we need a launch pad? You know, we have crowd loans for, for parachains. Well, if you're, an, if you're a small project um, that just wants to enter the, the Kusama ecosystem, you're not going to be able to come out compete the big giants in, in the parachain ecos uh, in the parachain auctions, um, and you need that level of community. You need that level of resources to even really get to that. And the fact of the matter is, not many projects even need their own parachain, which is where we come into play, right? So we're trying to fill in that the niche gap that is left by by um, crowd loans. So that's why I, I believe that there are there's I mean, a huge future in these ecosystem enablers um and will there be developments that make our investors happy well i certainly hope so um you know <laughs> if not i um, you know, our, our development team is going to be going to have serious issues with me um no, i'm just kidding <laughs> but um <laughs> i mean so so i mean i i i, I think our investors will be happy because first of all, um, I'm in constant contact with them. And also because they know that what we're trying to build is ju not just an ideal, another ideal launch pad. You know, we have many different sort of technology and sort of features and, and products within that, within our launch pad that should actually um, make a lot of people's lives <laughs> easy when it comes to the IDO. Um, you know, so, one aspect that we're also trying to do is, um, you know, down the line, and this is another person I'm actually dropping here, um, that we want to start taking things mobile, um, you know, because how many times when you're, you know, trying to get allocation for an IDO, you're sitting in front of your laptop, and when you are, you can't, you can't be around and oh, like the IDO starts at 3 p.m. Oh well, you know, then that means at that time I have to be home, blah blah blah. Um, we don't. That's that's really inconvenient. So you know, we're actually trying to um, sort of we're developing various aspects so that we can start um, sort of offering this mobile experience to to our users by making KSM sort of go um, into an app or you know things like that. Um, so I think a lot of these developments are currently in in motion, and I think that will make our investors very happy. At least I hope so. Um, I, think that's so yeah. I, I think mobile is huge. So I think if you, yeah, you can get that because you're right. I don't like to do a lot of things on my, uh, on my phone or sometimes I'm just not real near it. And uh, yeah, if you can get into that mobile market, cause it's, it's tough for crypto and mobile sometimes to, to interoperate. So yeah, that's uh, I think that's great. And that would really help and make your investors happy as that was said. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I think the fourth question is going to be from uh, Laura, Laura Timothy. Um, asking about the most of the new investors only focus on the price of the token and the short term benefits of the project. So can you tell us about the motivation and benefits for investors to hold your token long term? Um, you know, that's, that's a really good question. Um, because I think when it comes to token holding, um, you know, as I'm, I'm going to sound a bit bad here, but I think many people hold the tokens not because they sincerely believe in the token itself, but they believe in what the token can be in the future. Because when you hold something, your perspective is in future tense. So it's all about what this token can be. Right? So that, that's where the, the potential really comes into play. Um, 
So that's why we are trying to sort of um, create different evolutionary phases of our token, right? So in the beginning, yes, you know, you tend you can vote directly on ideas, you know, so that's like sort of governance voting. Um, then you can get allocation depending on your tier. Um, so that's kind of direct benefit, you know. But what else is there, right? So um, we want our token holders to be essentially become a member of a of a giant force that can sort of provide early funding, right? So, you know, if this case and starter, it could be like a case and starter incubator, for example, um, where you know, this sort of funding or early funding to, to um, early stage teams can also come from um, our token holders and from the token itself. And the rewards will also, of course, um, be distributed to our token holders. Um, so I think that is where, where the future is going, um, you know, because I want our token holders to essentially be the owner of KSM Startup. I have no interest in um, maintaining full control over many, many years to come. I um, am a big fan and believer of DAO system. So um, that is that is where the future is headed. And, you know, hopefully our our token holders and investor, investors will be able to see that. Um, and hopefully it motivates them um, to hold the tokens. Man, I love that answer about how you're in favor of the DAO system, because I think that's really big, too. And I think a lot of organizations will be ran in the DAO system rather than the traditional, you know, CEO of, of a corporation eventually. So I, I, yeah, I, hope I, so. I, I I'm, I'm like minded with you on that. And I think it could be the future for sure. So that is four questions. Um, and each of those will win a whitelist spot. So one of the team members will get a hold of the four of you that were uh, asked questions of. And uh, some great questions, by the way, and some even better answers. I really feel like you gave us a good feel for KSM Starter um, today. Is, is a good uh, back and forth between us. However, whenever you hear somebody on an AMA and you kind of you're doing your own research by listening to to see when Kim here, but you can also go over to uh, KSMStarter.com. You can also go to their Telegram, ask some questions there. Figure out about the project. Find out more than what you were able to find out just in this hour here, and uh, you'll find yourself better educated. Even if you didn't get a whitelist spot, you still want to know about this project because it's a project that is new and innovative. And at Moon Willie, we're always, whether we're talking about our own token or just news and events, we always want to know on what's the cutting edge of innovation. And on this one, that was kind of birthed out of somebody that was in politics. Then it was birthed out a chain that was used as a test net. And now we've got a full-fledged launch pad. It's got some interesting beginnings and you'll do yourself a favor to continue to educate yourself about KSM Starter. So make sure you do that. Make sure you are able to do that. Uh, uh, See when Kim here in the last little bit, um, we've got something that we normally do here on this uh, on this podcast, and you can join in or you can sign off here in a moment. But uh, we one time had a community member that rewrote the words to "I want to be a millionaire," and he wrote the words to. I want to be a moon millionaire. But before mm-hmm. I do that, I want to get one more piece of information from you. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that is, I'd like you to close us out with a word. There's someone out there who's listening right now, trying to find their purpose, trying to find what they're passionate about. Their brand is all over the place. They're going through all the woes of life. What do you say to them? Cl- close us out with a word. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so, um, uh, that's that's really interesting and a slightly difficult question. Um, I would say that you know, I mean, at least at least from from my experience, I mean, obviously in in public, you know, I try to you know maintain like a very very cool, calm attitude and things like that. But there are so many nights when you know I'm I'm in constant doubt. Um, you know, I'm asking everything about myself. You know, am I even fit to be a founder? You know, these kind of things. I haven't slept well since <laughs> since case <laughs> started really event life. Um, but you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to these worries, and I know that a lot of people tend to battle with these, is that you can never truly make a right choice. You know, how you make a right choice is that you make a decision and then you do everything in your power to make that decision the right decision that you would have made. Because I think all of us have the power to at least dictate how 
the result of our own actions come by doing more follow-up actions. So having said that, it's going to take a lot of resources, I think a lot of emotional power from, from those, especially you know, who want to start their own thing um, and, and who are maybe trying to find what they're passionate about. Um, but I think the one question that really should everyone should ask when they're thinking about what they're passionate about is, you know, what is that one thing that you are willing to risk everything for, right? So, you know, and, and there are many different answers, of course, but, you know, you look at that thing and you say, you know what, I can risk everything I have right now, including my, my job, my sleep, my hobby and things like that, if I can just make that happen. And if you're ready to risk everything, then that is your choice. You know, then, then you make that decision, you, then you follow up on that promise that you have made by saying that you're going to risk everything. So therefore go for it, you know? Um, so that is, I guess, what I would advise. And that is what I also try to do for myself, um, on, on a really daily basis. Um, because I think it's a, it's an ongoing daily struggle. And, you know, every morning you just have to wake up and make the same decision you made yesterday and just stick to it. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I would say. That's, that's a fantastic answer. And I do think many of us have to wake up in the morning and say, you know, for you, you may have to wake up in the morning and say, dang it, I am the best token founder in the world. Okay. And you just have to say that not to be, not to be, uh, you know, haughty or, or, you know, thinking you're better than everyone. But I think sometimes we have to do that to counteract that voice on the inside, the imposter syndrome voice that's telling you you're not good enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I exactly. think sometimes we have to have something in us that counteracts that horrible inner voice that tells you you're not good enough. And I think exactly what you said is exactly the way to be able to do that. You know, what are you willing to give up? Are you willing to give up everything for your goals? And uh, if so, that certainly can help with that, that kind of imposter syndrome that you're dealing with. So I really appreciate you coming here today. I really appreciate, uh, you know, you even founding KSM Starter. I really appreciate you <laughs> founding that. But you've get, given some insightful information here today. And I really thank you so much for being able to, to just show up and give so much to our community. <laughs> No worries. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for having me. Um, and you know, I really encourage everyone to to join our um, community because soon we're also going to be having another competition where people can win more whitelisting spots. Um, so, you know, um, I would like to invite everyone to join our community and, and find out more about KSM Stata. Awesome. Kevin, did you, you want to say something? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, so you wanna thank you for coming. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, I know we, you know, asked you to come on short notice, but, um, you know, it was, it was excellent. We, we enjoyed your question, you know, your answers to the questions. Um, I know uh, this is like a small movement right now, but we're uh, promoting this every day. This is going to be on all our platforms. Uh, we're going to be constantly showing this. We love KSM Starter. We believe in it. And we can't wait to see where it goes. Uh, we're definitely going to be letting our community members know that they can win some more whitelist spots. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you so much for having me. I really had a lot of fun. Um, probably one of the best AMS I've had so far. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the official Moon Willy podcast. Don't forget to head to moonwilly.com and learn more about this exciting token. This podcast is not financial advice. Do not take anything said in this podcast as advice for buying or selling any crypto, stock, index, or other trading tool. You should do your own research or seek the help of a trained financial advisor. This is for entertainment only. The information contained in or provided from or through this podcast is not intended to be and does not constitute financial advice, investment advice, trading advice, or any advice.